Welcome. Thank you to those of you who are here. To um, this is the panel on uh, legal challenges and dilemmas in refugee law. So um, thank you for coming, and those of you online, thank you for participating. Uh, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that we're on unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, my name is Jamie Liu. I'll be moderating this panel. Um, I just wanted to say that this panel came about last year where CARFEMS was in Victoria and Donald Galloway had organized a really great panel with local pra le legal practitioners to talk about um, some trends that were happening in the legal world with regards to refugees. Um, and it was a, a great way to kind of get acquainted with some of these um, challenges and trends. Um, so we decided to bring it back this year. This year we're highlighting um, some experts in the legal profession in Ottawa. And so t on my very far left is Jackie Bonasteel. She's with Corporate Immigration Law Firm. And she's working on some very interesting test case litigation right now with regards to Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, next to her is Michael Bobson. He's with Community Legal Services here in Ottawa and has appeared at the Supreme Court of Canada, we think, five or six times. Um, and to my immediate left is Lila Demerdash, also from Community Legal Services, um, appeared at the Supreme Court of Canada three times. So we have you know, a lot of expertise here to share with um, all of you today. So what we're going to be doing today is um, we have identified six different issues. Um, I'm going to frame them in a conversational question style period and each of the panelists are going to answer them between five and ten minutes. What I'll do is um, at the end of going through these six issues, uh, we'll open it up for questions and I'll take a block of questions before um, I get the panelists to answer them. Okay, so without further ado, um, the first question we're, you know, preoccupied with is, you know, there's increasing attention, as you all know, paid to the Canada-U.S. border and the number of migrants attempting to cross it. Uh, what are the legal challenges being brought to the application of the Safe Third Country Agreement and why is it, um, you know, relevant for us studying uh, this area of, the, of research? Um, Michael's going to take that on. Does this work? Okay. Um, thanks, Jamie. Um, <clears throat> just for, for the uh, sake of the 10 of us in the room and the millions online, uh, I'm just going to start with some basic background just so that we're all on the same page. So the U.S.-Canada Safe Third Country Agreement, um, which has been in force since the end of December 2004, uh, basically uh, makes refugee claimants who arrive from the United States uh, at a land border between the U.S. and Canada ineligible to have their refugee claim determined in this country. Uh, and there are certain well-defined exceptions to that rule, uh, but if you don't fall into one of the exceptions, then uh, what it means is that you are turned back into the United States and then you have to make your claim for protection under U.S. law. So the courts have held that the Safe Third Country Agreement is essentially a responsibility sharing uh, pact between two countries that are both signatory to the Refugee Convention and the uh, UN Convention Against Torture. Um, and so the, the, the premise is that it's perfectly safe for us to send people back to the United States. Uh, we're both sharing the burden, if you will, of determining those refugee claims. So in 2005, three uh, organizations, the Canadian Council for Refugees, Amnesty International, and the Canadian Council for Churches, joined with a anonymous applicant uh, called John Doe in the litigation and challenged um, the legitimacy of the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, <clears throat> what the, the applicants uh, uh, raised as an argument was that it was ultra-virus uh, of the government to enter into this agreement. In other words, they didn't have the authority to enter into the agreement because the United States did not meet the dev shouldn't have met the designation as a safe country. The <clears throat> matter went to court, and a federal court 
judge, uh, Justice Phelan, uh, found that, in fact, the agreement was ultra-virus, that the conditions in the United States for s asylum seekers uh, essentially made it an unsafe country for them to be in, and so he struck down the agreement. <clears throat> Uh, on the basis that the, the claimants, Section 7, right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and 15, Section 15, right to equality, equal treatment under the law, had been violated by this agreement. That decision was appealed to the Federal Court of Appeal in Canada, and in a decision uh, from 2007, the Federal Court of Appeal actually didn't address any of Justice Phelan's findings about what was going on in the United States. They looked at the, the case from a strictly administrative law perspective and said, well, uh, the government in fact did have the authority to enter into this agreement and to bring in these regulations, and that was really the end of the discussion. So, um, you know, you might argue that they, you know, in that case missed the forest uh, of everything that was happening in the United States for this little administrative law tree, uh, but that's what they did. Uh, leave was sought at the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court did not grant leave. So for the last 10 or 11 years, what that means is that, again, claimants coming up from the United States who are sent back are being faced with a system that uh, 10, 11 years ago, a judge of this court said is really, really bad. Um, so um, I want to talk a bit about what's going on in the United States um, because that's really the root of why all these people are coming up to Canada, why they're crossing into our border. And it's why now, 11 years later, there's a new court challenge to the Safe Third Country Agreement. So I'm going to just talk about four out of many issues uh, about what's going on in the U.S. asylum system. One is the issue of large-scale detentions. A uh, 2014 study found that at that time there were 44, over 44,000 asylum seekers in the states who were detained. 77%, three quarters of all asylum seekers in the United States were um, in immigration court proceedings were detained. That's a huge problem. A second issue at the states is what we call the one year uh, bar rule. If you haven't initiated your asylum claim within one year of entering the United States, uh, with two narrow exceptions for changed circumstances or extraordinary circumstances, both of which are narrowly defined by the US courts, you're out of luck. You cannot make an asylum claim. Doesn't matter how bad things are for you back home. If you've missed that one year uh, limit, you're ineligible to make a claim. The third issue, which was raised in 2005, 2006 challenge, is how gender-based claims are treated in the United States. Women, by the way, are dispro disproportionately affected by the one year uh, bar rule. Uh, they don't know that you can be a refugee because of gender violence or because of FGM or forced marriage or, or things that we accept as grounds, legitimate grounds for refugee claims in Canada. They don't know that um, and so they don't make claims. Um, even if they do make a claim within the one year bar, the way that, the, that gender claims are uh, assessed or the way that the convention is interpreted in the United States with respect to gender um, is, to say the least, problematic. Um, <clears throat> for many years, because gender is not one of the five enumerated grounds in the Refugee Convention, it's not race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, for years U.S. courts said, well, you're not a refugee because your claim is not based on any of those five grounds. In Canada, we consider gender to be uh, part of, member of membership in a particular social group. In 2014, finally, a Board of Immigration Appeals uh, decision in a case called ARCG did find, finally, that women facing domestic violence uh, could fit into a particular social group. Uh, the problem is that that decision has been, unfortunately, rather narrowly interpreted in the States. So the applicant in that case uh, was a married woman, and some immigration court judges have said uh, gender violence only applies to legally married. If, you're, if your abuser is your legally married um, spouse, um, other judges have denied asylum to domestic violence survivors if they've managed to divorce their abuser, even if their abuser has continued to stalk them and rape them after the divorce. Also in the US, the way they interpret gender is you have to show that the motivation for the abuse was gender. 
And so courts have said, well, it wasn't, you know, it was because he was jealous or it's because it was for personal reasons. It had nothing to do with the fact that you're a woman. Um, all of which is to say it's very tough, much tougher for women in the States to be accepted on gender-based claims than it is here. And finally, again, I could go on and on, but there is in the United States this process called expedited removals. If you arrive without a valid passport or travel document, if you're or, or at the border, or if you're within 100 miles of the border and you can't prove you've been in the States for more than two weeks, you're put into this process, which is a very speedy way to deport you. You can claim asylum. You can say, I'm afraid to go back, in which case you're supposed to be referred to what's called a credible fear uh, interview. Um, <clears throat> but there's problems with that. And one of the problems with that is that the standard uh, in the credible fear um, interviews is very high. Uh, claimants must show a substantial and realistic probability of succeeding in their claim, uh, which, to say the least, is much higher than the standard we apply in Canada. So um, all of that is still going on in the United States. And everything that was happening 10 years ago, uh, in fact, uh, is worse. And this brings us to present day. And as you probably have heard, uh, since last year, Donald Trump has been president of the United States. Um, within days of him uh, taking office, uh, Trump issued three executive orders that, that, that concern immigration and refugees. Um, and so if we had any doubt about his attitude and his government's attitude towards immigrants and refugees, it was pretty clear within you know, less than a month where he was headed. The first order famously barred access to U.S. territory by nationals of certain Muslim-majority uh, countries. Uh, the order also suspended the arrival of refugees who had already been processed to be resettled in the United States. The order said, no, they're not coming here. The second executive order broadly defined priorities for deportation, uh, encouraged immigration officials to prosecute migrants and asylum seekers for, f asylum seekers for illegal entry, and dramatically expanded the powers of arrest and detention. The third executive order concerned that infamous wall um, to be built between the US and Mexico border. Uh, it also called for the return of asylum seekers to, quote, contiguous territory, for example, Mexico, pending adjudication of their asylum claims. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So, what you might anticipate have happened when Donald Trump became president has, in fact, happened. And the situation now in the United States is very bad and very hard for asylum seekers. Um, asylum seekers can be paroled, but the executive order says that that uh, power should be used only sparingly. And the reality is that the vast majority of asylum seekers in the United States are in detention, and they remain in detention throughout the whole process. <clears throat> that means it's harder for them to get a lawyer uh, a study from a couple of years ago showed that only 14% of detained asylum seekers get counsel compared to two-thirds who aren't detained. So you don't have a lawyer. That's already going to make it harder for you to be accepted. It's hard to make phone calls. It's hard to get an interpreter. They keep moving you from jail to jail. So even if you have a lawyer, your lawyer can't find you. Um, if you came with your family, you're often separated from your spouse or your kids. Um, and it's and needless to say, it's hard to get evidence, especially from back home, to support your claim. Um, and that's not to mention the conditions in prisons. Two minutes remaining. OK, things are very bad in conditions. I won't go into detail. Um, <clears throat> in terms of gender, um, recently, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, or earlier this year, intervened in the case of a Salvadoran uh, claimant of domestic violence. He wants to basically turn back the clock and overturn the 2014 decision saying that you can be accepted as a refugee on the basis of gender. OK. Um, and all sorts of other things are going on. So uh, last fall, the three organizations that went to court 10 years ago have started a new application. <clears throat> the last time that this happened, the court criticized the applicants by saying, you know, their applicant, their, their individual applicant, Mr. Doe, in fact, had never even come to the uh, Canadian-U.S. border. And they said, look, get a case where someone actually approaches Canada and is turned back. So this time, uh, in addition to the three organizations, there's a family, a mother and two daughters, uh, who are also claimants uh, and applicants in this, in this application challenging the law. 
Uh, we're also changed our legal tactics. We're not saying anymore that this uh, law is ultra-virus. We're, we're basically saying that um, people who are affected by this law, um, their se Section 7 right to life, liberty, and security of the person, um, and their uh, equality rights are being affected by being sent back. And so this law is unconstitutional. Um, <clears throat> the court granted us leave. Um, a number of other individual uh, claimants uh, or people affected by the agreement have challenged the law. We're all joined. The hearing scheduled to take place next January. Um, I think one of the main you know, legal uh, hurdles we're going to face is whether that law uh, is in accordance with the principles of uh, fundamental justice, even if there is a violation. Uh, we've argued, among other things, that the law is arbitrary, that <clears throat> the effect of the agreement, which is to put people at risk, uh, is arbitrary in the sense that it's inconsistent with the objective or goal of the agreement, which is to send people back to countries where those conventions are not only um, We've, they've signed on to but are complied with. And basically what we're saying is the United States no longer complies with those conventions. It's not safe for people to go back to the United States. And uh, that is all my time, I think. And so uh, that's basically an update on what's happening with Safe Third Country. And needless to say, and I think other people are going to say it, um, you know, everything that's happening in the States has caused thousands of people to come to Canada and make claims. It's backlogged the system here. Um, the only positive thing about it is they've decided to reopen the uh, IRB in Ottawa uh, because Montreal can't handle all these people. And, but apart from everything like that, it's all negative. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that very comprehensive but quick overview of what's going on um, in the legal scene with regards to the legal challenge to the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, I think this is a nice segue to our second question. Um, as Michael said, there are uh, many migrants crossing the Canada-US border, and those of the, that are finding themselves within Canada are making refugee claims. And so Jackie's going to tell us what legal barriers and challenges those migrants within Canada's borders face once they do make it across. I'm going to say seated, if that's all right. Um, yeah, so that was a perfect segue, Michael, thank you. Um, I did, this has actually been in the media this week. Um, there's been a few articles that have talked about the fact that um, the rate of acceptance for those who enter the country irregularly, now all the media articles will say illegally, which um, is a particular pet peeve of mine, so the language should be irregular. There's nothing illegal about entering Canada um, at an irregular border crossing to make a refugee claim. But the rate of acceptance has gone down pretty significantly. Um, it's been about 40% in the first three months of 2018 compared to 53% for all of the year 2017. So clearly there are some significant legal challenges to making a refugee claim once people enter um, at the Canada-US border. Um, I also find it interesting the government's messaging on this has changed significantly. So Minister Hussein actually retweeted one of these articles referring to the low rates of acceptance and uh, said, claiming asylum is not a free ticket to Canada. Each claim is evaluated on its own merit and unsuccessful claimants are removed. So again, pretty significant shift from the Trudeau tweet at the height of the travel ban with hashtag welcome to Canada. So clearly the government's feeling the strain. Um, I think a, a significant issue that many claimants are going to face is just the, the mere fact of the delay itself. So um, if you're waiting a year or two years to have your first appearance before the Refugee Protection Division, you know, the, the chances of being able to prove that you face that well-founded fear of persecution um, that you meet the definition under Section 96 or 97, for a lot of people that's going to become all the more challenging the more time passes, the more time you're away from that agent of persecution. And particularly for, for many claimants coming up from the U.S., many of them have spent years in the U.S. So, for example, the, the large number of Haitians that we saw about a year ago now um, had been living in the States since the time of the earthquake and, and making out a refugee claim um, from Haiti when you've been living in the U.S. for a very long time, really tough to do. So uh, certainly I think that's going to be a, a significant challenge and um, 
one that, in my own sort of anecdotal experience, claimants don't always anticipate. They have this sense that in Canada, everything's going to be a lot easier and not necessarily the case. Um, access to justice, just very practically, I think finding a lawyer is, is tough when we're seeing large numbers of claimants coming across and the legal aid system is strained. So access to quality counsel who are going to see you through this whole process, particularly with the long delays and, and the timelines being affected um, is, is going to be tough. Here in Ontario, there was uh, recently a lot of concern about legal aid funding cuts and uh, the funding seems to have more or less come through, but um, there's great information and statistics out there that uh, claimants are far more successful when they do have a lawyer involved in their case. Um, so I think that's, that's quite an important one. And then um, the difference in procedural protections that exist depending on how you entered Canada. So um, back in 2012, December 2012, the Refugee Appeal Division was introduced with great fanfare that finally we were going to have access to a full appeal after um, the, the Refugee Protection Division hearing. Um, but access to that appeal is, is not assured. So for those who enter Canada through the Safe Third Country Agreement, so they enter via one of the exceptions to the Safe Third Country Agreement at the Canada-US border, uh, they're currently barred from access to the RAD by Section 1102D of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And, and that's really quite significant. And um, I also find it sort of ironic that the government is now giving this messaging of, of trying to discourage a regular entry to Canada. But the fact is, if you enter Canada irregularly, you do get access to the appeal because it's only if you're entering at a legal border crossing and taking advantage of an exception to the Safe Third Country Agreement that you're barred from an appeal. So it's, it's really quite absurd. And we tried to make this argument. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we just lost. Um, I'll talk a bit about that. but. Uh, I'll just mention, you know, the lack of an appeal is is really significant. Sean Rehag is here today, and we cite him a lot. Um, a, a study by Sean and Angus Grant examined the appeals that were brought in the first two years of the RAD's existence, and um, high success rate, 26.4% of claims that were challenged at the RAD were overturned by the RAD. So clearly access to this appeal body is really important. A lot of um, decisions at first instance aren't necessarily the right decision. And um, those who enter via the STCA exceptions have really no right to review of their decision before being removed from Canada. They do still have access to federal court judicial review, but it's not suspensive, so it is possible that CBSA can come after them and remove them before that whole process is seen through. And it's also not a full appeal. It's, it's a judicial review on legal grounds, so it's, um, it doesn't carry the same protection that the RAD does. There's also no indication at all that those who enter through the Safe Third Country Agreement exceptions are any less deserving of an appeal. So I think um, the top 10 source countries, this is statistics from a few years back, but they included countries like Iraq, Eritrea, Syria. So clearly, you know, not, not claims that are abusive of the system. But anyway, unfortunately, it looks like this isn't going to change anytime soon. Um, I was actually, all four of us on the panel were part of the committee um, on the Kreshan case uh, that sought to challenge that STCA rad bar exception on section seven grounds. And unfortunately, after a long wait, Justice Henehan just denied us um, at the federal court. So we lost that challenge. Um, it'll be appealed to the Federal Court of Appeal. We're bringing the notice on Monday, so um, remains to be seen. We're still hopeful we can have this overturned, but as of right now, those who enter using that exception uh, lack the same procedural protections, which uh, is, is a big problem. So it, it's, it can be tough to advise people, right, when they're on the other side of the border and are asking, okay, I, I think I qualify for one of these safe third country agreement exceptions, what should I do? I mean, um, 
we <laughs> it's always tough because it, as lawyers we can't advise people to enter the country irregularly but um, I mean practically it, that may be the better thing for a refugee claimant to do because their procedural protections will be greater if they come up at Roxham Road rather than coming to the legal border crossing so I think that's about time I'll stop there Thanks, Jackie. So Jackie did a really good job of painting a picture of some of the legal barriers that some refugee claimants um, who are affected by the Safe Third Country Agreement have within Canada. Lila is going to be talking about another challenge that some refugee claimants are facing now at the Immigration and Refugee Board. Um, there has been a trend whereby women refugee claimants fleeing their, with their children are now being confronted with assertions that they are excluded for refugee protection under Article 1 FB of the Refugee Convention for serious non-political crimes due to allegations of kidnapping their own children. So she'll tell us a little bit more about this trend. Okay. Um, so as um, Jamie said, uh, even though uh, a woman might have fled the country because she has a well-founded fear of persecution, uh, having survived years of domestic violence, um, uh, and she takes her children with her, she can be excluded from uh, protection uh, on the basis of Article 1 FB, which is that she committed uh, a serious non-political crime, or there's reasons to believe that she's committed a serious non-political crime. When I first started practicing in 2002, uh, one of my first cases around 2002, 2003, was a woman who had fled uh, an abusive husband in Algeria. She had come to, she had gotten a visitor's visa to come to Canada to visit her sister, and she had uh, uh, obtained the authorization of her husband to come with her, the two children that they had. And uh, when he realized she wasn't going to be coming back, he uh, went to the Canadian Embassy and uh, asked for a visitor's visa. And it wasn't issued because his wife had made a claim for refugee protection. So he alleged that Canada was complicit in the kidnapping of his children. And that was under the UN Hague Convention. Um, uh, and so what happens is that the minister intervened in that case. Uh, and uh, she was facing exclusion because of the allegations of kidnapping uh, under the Hague Convention. Now, the Hague Convention, Article 3, sets out the criteria for establishing that the removal of a child has been wrongful. And so a child is wrongfully removed from a country where it breaches the custody rights of a person, um, and at the time of, and whether those custody rights are jointly held or not, and uh, where that person was exercising that custody. Uh, now, if the, there's a determination that the child has been wrong, wrongfully removed, then the Article 12 of the Hague Convention says that the, the, the state where the child is has to order the return of that child to its country of uh, habitual residence. In the refugee context, it means that somebody can be excluded from refugee protection for a serious non-political crime. Now, there are defenses to that under the Hague Convention, uh, and one of the first, and those are at Article 13, uh, and that's where you can show that the wrongful removal was uh, done to prevent the child from facing uh, or exposing them to a great grave risk of physical or psychological harm. Uh, where the child is mature is another and can uh, uh, himself or herself uh, state what their preference would be. Um, and also uh, where you can show that um, returning the child to the place would be a violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So in the, uh, so what happens is that if you can show that there's going to be harm for the child, you could defeat that. And that's what we did in that case of the woman from Algeria. We got uh, uh, a designated representative was appointed to for the children because of the, the potential conflict between the children and the mother. And I obtained a psychological report uh, from a child psychologist who interviewed the children alone and separate from the mother. And uh, we were able to provide evidence that she, that they had, not only had they been at risk by uh, witnessing the violence, because that's a form of violence in and of itself, but he had been violent with the, with the children too. And she won her claim. 
In 2005, uh, there's a case called Kovax that uh, was in front of the Federal Court of Canada. And in Kovax versus Kovax, the husband had brought an application, a Hague Convention application for the return of his children. And the Ontario courts found that the did not order the return because they found that, in fact, there was a defense that the, the, the mother had made out that the children would be at risk if they were returned. The federal court, of the, uh, the federal court with respect to the refugee claim, uh, the, Mrs. Kovacs had been found it was excluded, and the federal court upheld that decision on the basis that even though there was a Hague application that had not been uh, granted, uh, there was a serious non-political crime, that they didn't have to look at the Hague. So it's not only where the Hague Convention uh, uh, is brought up that they can look at this issue of exclusion. And that's the trend that we're finding more and more. I act as designated representative often before the board, and it surprises me the number of times where even where there is no Hague allegation, that, uh, that issue will arise. And, uh, an example that I had is another woman from, she was from Lebanon. It was years of domestic violence. And the, uh, she said in her narrative that she had applied for a visa for her and her children. And she knew her husband would not let her take the children out of the country. So she forged his signature. So the, there was a ministerial intervention. And again, we faced the same issue. We got a psych report for the mother. And it's really important in these cases for the person to spend time with the children. Because I sat with the son independently of the mother to ask him you know what life was like with his father had his father ever been violent and he said no and as we talked he said at one point that he was scared of his father and I said well why are you scared of your father he goes well you know I get punished uh, when I get punished when I do something wrong he screams at me I said what what does he just scream at you goes well sometimes he'll hit me and I said but you told me he wasn't violent with you he said no but that's different i I was being punished it's because I did something wrong so it's, if you don't have the time, if you don't have somebody that will sit with the children and actually talk to the children and get an idea of what's happening for the children and the cultural context of what we see as corporal punishment and what they see as corporal punishment, the claim will be defeated. Uh, and again, we got another child psychologist in. We wrote, rewrote the narratives and uh, we brought the defense. So where, what happens where there's no Hague uh, application is it's the Criminal Code of Canada. And those are sections 280 to 80, 286 of the Criminal Code that talk about uh, ch child abduction. Again, there are defenses that you can bring about. Um, but what happens is that exclusion is first if the person is excluded, they don't have to look at inclusion. And so what happens is now you have more and more women that are appearing before the board that have very valid claims for refugee protection that are not being examined because this issue is being brought up. They're on the defensive, right? So they're not talking about their persecution, they're trying to defend their actions. And a mother is not gonna leave her children in a situation <laughs> of violence. So that's one of the disconcerting things that we're seeing um, at, uh, at the board. Thanks, Lila. That's a great overview of a disturbing trend that's really um, you know, creating a huge barrier for women refugee claimants, um, you know, providing some access to the, for refu refugee protection. We're going to jump to a different topic now, moving away from the refugee context and um, you know, acknowledging that the government has studied the issue of temporary foreign workers and suspended the living caregiver program. Uh, Jackie does a lot of work with uh, temporary foreign workers and uh, will give us an overview of what uh, changes and what the legal situation is right now with regards to caregivers in Canada. Yeah, so to say that this has changed in the past few years would be a huge understatement. The pendulum has really swung completely on this issue. So Canada used to have a really robust live-in caregiver program, and it was right there in the name, live-in caregiver. So it was a requirement of the program that the temporary foreign worker being hired to care for children or um, those with high medical needs lived in with the family. Um, and it was a very popular program, um, 
particularly, I mean, the Philippines, we all know, is uh, the top source country and was one of the top source countries for immigrants overall in Canada. Um, still is, I believe. And um, the issue that I'm, I'm sure many of you know we were seeing is the power imbalance that this created. So the fact of being required to live in with the employer created a lot of potential for isolation, for control of that caregiver. And I'm sure we've all seen these sort of high profile cases where there was abuse, um, serious abuse of, of living caregivers or um, being severely underpaid, essentially treated like slaves. So big issue that got a lot of attention and this, this led the government to completely overhaul the program. Um, so, the first step to a live-in caregiver coming to Canada is applying for a temporary work permit. And the default is no longer that you have to live in. And in fact, if an employer wants their caregiver to live in, they have to jump through a lot of hoops. They actually, um, unless a, a, an exception applies, they can't say in their advertising for the position that they want the caregiver to live in. They have to say something along the lines of, um, accommodation is not mandatory for this position, it is being offered, but anyway, you have to be really careful about the language that you use. Um, and it's also become really, really challenging to be approved for these work permits. Uh, so employers need to advertise the position, prove that there is no Canadian or permanent resident who is available to do the job. And there's the, in recent years, there's been a really high rate of refusal. So if you don't tick every box in the application process, if you don't have the language of your advertisements absolutely perfect, if the government, uh, Service Canada, has any suspicion at all that there were Canadian Canadians or permanent residents who were qualified, then you're not getting approved. So many employers who had used this program in the past were unpleasantly surprised to learn that it had become a lot more onerous than it used to be. And then on the permanent resident side, um, it used to be that a caregiver could come on one of these work permits work for two years for an employer, and basically that was the only requirement to apply for permanent residence. So obviously the fact of being able to eventually apply for permanent residence was a massive incentive for caregivers who did come over. Their entire plan was to eventually get their families here. And that live-in caregiver permanent residence program was scrapped completely and it was replaced by two pilot programs. So one for those who worked with children and one for those who worked with um, the elderly or those with high medical needs. And the new pilot programs had significantly more onerous um, eligibility requirements. So it still required that two years of work experience as a caregiver in Canada, but also there was a post-secondary education requirement and a language requirement, um, which wasn't quite consistent with the requirements to get the work permit. So a lot of people would qualify to come on the work permit, but would never meet those qualifying criteria for permanent residence. And what we've seen with these pilot programs is it's got like the fastest processing time I've ever seen because there's so few applicants. So <laughs> if you do have someone who qualifies, it's great because they just fly right through. But so few people qualify that it really isn't working. Um, so I think the government is now starting to recognize this. The pilot programs are being scrapped. Um, so they're, they run until September 2019 and it was just recently announced that those programs are being discontinued. And as of right now, they've been replaced with nothing. So um, obviously this is causing a lot of panic in both uh, the employer community and the temporary foreign worker community. Um, wondering what's going to happen, if it's going to be replaced with anything or nothing at all. Um, if, if I had to guess, I would say the government is going to replace it with something and, well, it's not totally a guess, um, Minister Hussein has indicated that there is something coming. Um, but really there is, uh, there's a lot of reason for the government to sort of implement something that looks a little bit closer to the old living caregiver program. So I think the pendulum is going to start swinging back, at least to some extent. Um, because the fact is, the caregiver program was a hugely successful economic program for Canada. There's um, statistics showing that caregivers pay some of 
pay taxes at a much higher rate than other types of immigrants to Canada, um, that they're economically successful and not on social assistance within one year, five year, ten years of arriving in Canada. So, um, you know, a, quite a successful program despite uh, the, the serious issues with power imbalances and, and abuse that we see. Um, what else was I going to say? And I think the other thing that I see in my practice is that there really is a genuine need here in Canada for this program, and that's only going to increase as well as, as our population ages. I see it especially on the elder care side, I'd say more than the child care side, where employers who come see me really genuinely haven't been able to find a Canadian or permanent resident to do the job, and they need someone living at home with their loved one who needs uh, the medical care. I spoke about this at a conference, um, sort of about the minutia of the process a couple weeks ago and joked that I sort of do the opposite of a sales pitch when I have a potential client who wants to hire me to help them with one of these applications because my first spiel is about all the reasons why you would never ever want to go through this process. It's awful. You have to jump through all these hoops. The rate of acceptance is really low. Um, but at the end of the day, people still want to go through with it because they need to. So it's an important program. Um, I, I think it's one that needs to continue. Definitely there were some changes needed. I think we just overcorrected and now um, we're starting to look at making some changes back in the other direction. So it'll be interesting to see how things develop over the next couple years. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, we'll be waiting to see what happens before um, the end of the pilot programs. Um, so next, we wanted to also, you know, touch upon how the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Minister Goodell, announced a few years ago that there would be a greater investment in building immigration detention facilities. Um, and the turn towards de detention has brought forward a number of legal challenges to immigration detention. And so Lila here is going to give us a little overview of what those are. So in August 2016, uh, Minister Goodell released a framework that was aimed at overhauling the immigration detention system. Now, according to CBSA, uh, the aim of the National Immigration Detention Framework is to create a fair immigration detention system that supports the humane and dignified treatment of individuals while protecting public safety. So that's what the aim is. Uh, it's supposed to be launched, it was supposed to be launched in April, but it was put back to June. Uh, and um, somebody said today, I spoke to someone who said they thought June 22nd, but we don't know if it's gonna go forward or not. There's, it's based on four pillars, partnerships, alternatives to detention, mental health and transparency. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what these four pillars are, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the criticisms uh, with this, or with, uh, with the, the the framework. So in terms of partnership, uh, partnerships, they're working, CBSA has been consulting and working with various stakeholders to assist with the design development and um, the design and the implementation of this framework. And so one of the things that they're doing is that they're going to be working with community partners to see about uh, providing supervision and case management services for people who have been for whom they found an alternative to detention. So they're gonna be working with the John Howard Society and the Salvation Army. Um, the, the services that these organizations are supposed to be providing will be community monitoring, acting as guardians for individuals who can't get a cash bond or have a family post a bond. Um, helping ensure that people comply with the terms and conditions of their release and uh, assisting clients to show up to the different uh, immigration proceedings. Uh, in terms of alternatives to detention, uh, CBSA is now supposed to be actively looking and working on alternatives to detention. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out in uh, an immigration detention uh, hearing room because uh, in in my experience, CBSA sits back and says, oh, well, we, we're not opposed to an alternative to detention, but nothing's been presented. But now there's a onus on them to actually work on alternatives and find alternatives for people. Um, so first, it's in they have to try and identify alternatives before there's a decision to detain. 
um, in, in a holding center. And then there's the question of where the person will be placed. So they have to start with the least, uh, so uh, uh, an immigration holding center if possible or wherever possible first and foremost and then a prison. Uh, in Ottawa, it's a moot question. There's no, there's no other place but the Ottawa Carlton Detention Center. So everybody's gonna be going there that's on immigration hold. Uh, so they have to look at increasing uh, 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 some things like uh, being more flexible for bonds. Uh, they're looking at uh, a national voice reporting system, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why it was delayed. Um, not the main reason, but one of the decision, uh, the reasons, so that the person could comply with, could can comply with reporting uh, by calling in. They want to expand the electronic uh, monitoring system, supervision tools like the ankle monitoring. Um, and so they're going to start that on a pilot basis in Toronto. Uh, and what's interesting is that now there's going to be a monthly review by a manager at CBSA of, a det of anybody who's been detention detained for over 60 days so in the hope that 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 they that it will uh, they'll have more consistency of decision making, but also that somebody else is reviewing to see if they really need to keep this person in detention. It will be interesting to see how it it plays out. They've also um, one of the f the pillars is vulnerable persons and mental health. So it, it, they CBSA has indicated in their framework that they remain committed to improving detainee well being. Uh, by ensuring safe, secure, and humane detention conditions, which is going to be interesting in Ottawa when the place is OCDC. But. Um, and so they've given a definition of who they consider to be uh, uh, a vulnerable person. And it says it includes pregnant women and nursing mothers, minors under the years of 18, elderly persons, persons suffering from a severe medical condition or disability, persons suffering from restricted mobility, persons with suspected or known mental illnesses and victims of human trafficking. Now, silent is uh, LGBTI, uh, vulnerable people, and especially when they're being put in a prison, uh, it's a huge problem. Uh, and also, they have not included women facing uh, gender violence. They have the trafficking, but they don't have any other. So it's very limited. Now, uh, with the issue of mental health, the framework says that they want to look at uh, limiting detention of persons living with mental health issues, expanding the availability and use of alternatives, and improving access to essential medical and mental health services in the locations. But those are in the holding centers. Um, so it, again, if the person's being held in a prison, it's a different issue. In 2017, Mr. Minister Goda, Goodale uh, uh, issued a ministerial direction for the treatment of minors in Canada's immigration detention system. Um, and so they issued a national directive for the detention or housing of minors uh, that reaffirms that the detention of a minor must be a measure of last resort, taking into account other applicable grounds and criteria, including the best interests of the children. Now, um, this came about, this directive was hugely, um, uh, came about because of a federal court case uh, that was brought uh, about where, uh, for the litigation of, where the children were being uh, detained. It was brought by, um, um, sorry, I have that here somewhere. Um, a Justice for Children and Youth. Uh, and um, where they looked at uh, the best interest of the children. And so really, uh, the federal court has said that the detention of children has to be a measure of last resort. Uh, and you have to look at all of the uh, children affected by the decision to detain. So what CBSA is coming out in their framework is to say that alternative to detentions must always be considered first for minors and their parents, uh, and they have to be actively pursued until release. The unity of the family is to be highly factored in all detention-related decisions. Uh, the best interests of the children are a primary consideration. Uh, and may only be outweighed by other significant considerations, such as public safety or national security. Um, the, the best interest analysis has to be conducted before the detention and throughout the detention. 
Um, okay. Um, and then, um, oh, I only have two minutes. So I'm going to go in terms of there's issues with transparency and monitoring that they've, they're trying to f work on. Uh, and then I wanted to talk about some of the um, some of the problems that this does not uh, uh, this framework w does not address. And the main one I wanted to talk about is the length of detention. That's the the framework is completely silent on the length of detention. So the problem in Canada is that a person can find themselves on uh, indefinite detention because there's no maximum limit to the time that a person can be detained, unlike in other countries. So there are some legal challenges that have been brought forward on that. There's a case called Brown, uh, Alvin Brown, uh, and it, uh, there is, uh, and there's a, been a bunch of um, where uh, uh, immigration advocates have been tired with the the immigration. Uh, detention system under the Immigration Refugee Protection Act and the federal court's uh, jurisdiction of only judicial reviews, they've been bringing forward habeas corpus applications to the Ontario courts and other courts across Can provincial courts across Canada to have the legality of that detention looked at. And so there's a case called Scotland, there's some other cases that have been coming forward, and there's now a case that has gone up to the Supreme Court of Canada on whether in an, on a, uh, called China, um, and to see whether or not the legality, uh, can you bring a habeas corpus application when you have a, uh, a framework of detention that's supposed to be quote unquote comprehensive. So it'll be an interesting to see where that goes. Thank you so much, Lila. Uh, yeah, that's going to be coming up to the court in the fall, I believe. So we'll be watching with interest how the Supreme Court deals with the habeas corpus applications. Um, so finally, our last issue, but not least, is, um, you know, related to the issue of detention and refugee claims and family reunification is um, the courts are paying a lot more attention to the issue of the mental health of applicants in the immigration system. Um, and you know, Michael's going to give us an overview of, you know, what the courts have been saying on this, but also how it has been uh, received in, you know, the way that the immigration system is being enforced. I find if I stand up, there's a greater chance I won't fall asleep during my own talk. Um, so uh, mental health comes up in a number of uh, immigration-related contexts. So with respect to refugees and refugee claimants, uh, the mental health of the claimant can affect that person's ability to testify, uh, the claimant's ability to remember things that happened, uh, things that are relevant to their claim for protection. Uh, the, a person's mental health um, <clears throat> condition can also be the basis for persecution because in some countries, people who have mental health issues are subject to persecution. Um, also, it can if a person's uh, mental health condition is such that they don't understand the nature of the proceedings, then the board can uh, appoint a designated representative uh, to act for them or represent them in proceedings before the Immigration and Refugee Board. In applications based on humanitarian and compassionate grounds, a person's mental health uh, condition can uh, be relevant to whether he or she would face discrimination in their country on account of uh, their mental health condition. Uh, often it can be a case where the person is able to get treatment for that condition in Canada and have support network, uh, support network here, uh, which doesn't exist in the country back home, and so that would be the basis for uh, an argument that, that he or she would face hardship if sent back to their country. Um, <clears throat> in family sponsorships, um, mental health becomes an issue if the person being sponsored has a condition that uh, could cause excessive demand on our health and social services. That person could be found to be inadmissible to Canada under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Uh, it also comes up in spousal sponsorship cases where one of the spouses has a mental health condition. Uh, the board, often these cases are, are refused and they go to the Immigration Appeal Division. And the board often even overtly will ask itself how can this relationship be genuine? Why would someone marry someone like you who has this mental health condition? It happens. Um, 
a number of years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, considered a case called Kantha Sami. And uh, the case was uh, based on a humanitarian and compassionate application. Um, the main issue in Kantha Sami was what is the test in an H and C application? Uh, what is the test for hardship? Um, but the court uh, commented in a number uh, of paragraphs in the decision on mental health uh, issues, uh, in particular on how decision makers are to treat psychological reports uh, of people who are applying to remain in Canada on humanitarian grounds. So looking at some recent jurisprudence, I don't think there's anything new in the law in terms of um, post Kantha Sami. I think when you read decisions, what you find is that the judges, by and large, seem to have got it. Uh, but decision makers, officers, immigration officers, pro officers, uh, board members, they are not always getting uh, how to deal with, with mental health issues. So I have just a few examples. Um, there was a case called uh, Sitnikova uh, from last year. Uh, the case was an, a humanitarian application. The woman based her application primarily on her sexual orientation. There was a psych report uh, submitted in evidence in support of her application saying that she, if returned to Russia, her country, she would be at serious risk of psychological collapse and suicide. The officer who dealt with that application discounted the probative value of that report on the basis that the applicant had not sought follow-up treatment for her condition in Canada. In fact, she had, which was one of the errors that the officer made. Um, <clears throat> but again, that's something that the Supreme Court of Canada said in Kantha Sami, that that doesn't discount uh, what the psych report says just because someone doesn't follow up with treatment. And often people won't follow up because they can't afford treatment in this country. Um, the, other, the other thing that, hap that, that came out in uh, Sitnikova was um, the officer said, well, you can, you can, you know, yeah, you're at risk of suicide if you go back to Russia, but there's mental health uh, treatment in, in your country, and so I don't really give any value or give any weight to this report. And again, that's something that the, the Supreme Court in Canada Stanley specifically said, that's not relevant. You know, if, if, the, if the psychologist says that you're suffering from a uh, condition that's going to cause you severe psychological trauma if you go back, the fact that you can receive treatment in your country, maybe, um, is, not, is not a reason not to give any weight to that report. There was a case uh, from this year called Nagarasa, uh, which was uh, a pre-removal risk assessment application by a Sri Lankan man. Um, he um, suffered from depression. He had attempted suicide in the past. And, and in the decision, the officer refused the application. The officer said, I accept that the applicant suffers from depression and has attempted suicide in Canada. However, I find that the risk of self-harm or suicide is speculative and controllable by the applicant's own actions, and I've therefore assigned very little weight to it. So in overturning that decision, the federal court, uh, a fairly new just, justice called Justice Ahmed, uh, found, first of all, that the officer had contradicted uh, himself by saying, well, you know, on one hand, you accept that this person is, does have depression and has tried suicide. On the other hand, you say, well, uh, that's not a problem um, if you go back. But then he says, and I'm going to quote from this decision, the judge says, far more serious than this contradiction, however, is the utter unfamiliarity or insensitivity that the officer demonstrates towards issues of depression and mental health. Self-harm and suicide is not, and this is underlined in the decision, not controllable by a person who contemplates taking his or her own life. By definition, the fact that the applicant was willing to take his own life means that the pain with which he is suffering is so unbearable to him that in his view, the only answer is to end his own life. Other serious, uh, like other serious medical conditions, depression and other mental health issues often require intervention by specialists who can diagnose the problem and provide the treatment in the form of counseling, medication, etc. The judge goes on, as the officer was well aware the applicant's situation was so severe, he eventually came to the most extreme consequence of, of his condition. He attempted to take his own life. Only the most perverse characterization would call attempted suicide in these circumstances a choice, or in the officer's words, controllable by the applicant's own actions. I think the judge shows great sensitivity and awareness about mental health. 
And he doesn't stop there. Um, officers describe themselves as either immigration officers or senior immigration officers. And the judge says, particularly as a senior underlined immigration officer, BO, and again, it's very rare for federal court decisions to name the officer. He names them. Officer O, um, either knew or ought to have known better. Very strong words. Anyway, again, another example of the court saying, look at the great camera sound that you get it, you're still not getting it. Um, another case called Jang, same thing. Um, the applicant in H and C applicant uh, was turned down, had a psych report turned down because uh, he didn't or she didn't follow up with treatment. Um, in this case, the officer also said, I'm not giving any weight to this report because clearly it was made for immigration reasons. Yeah, the, the, the lawyer asked for this, therefore I'm not giving it any weight. Um, and again, the court really came down on that and said, look, at that's, if that were the standard, then no psych report would ever be given any weight uh, because the fact is that that's who asked for these reports is, is counsel. Um, so just summing up in terms of mental health, again, I think in terms of the jurisprudence, there's nothing really new under the sun. Um, but it's clear that courts are applying the, the reasoning in Kanthasamy uh, and that officers and board members are still not really getting it in every instance. I don't know if I have any time left. Um, I also thought I was supposed to look at uh, other <laughs> health conditions. There's a couple of cases where the applicants had HIV uh, or were, were living with HIV. Um, one of the decisions called um, AB, um, <clears throat> the, it was a family class sponsorship and the father had contacted or contracted HIV by having an extramarital affair and the Immigration Appeal Division uh, basically said, I don't think that's deserving of humanitarian consideration because you, you, know, you had, shouldn't have gone out and had an affair basically. Uh, and the federal court struck it down and said, you know, the, the IED is not moral police. Uh, the fact that this person is living with HIV uh, is, is, the, is the issue. How he or she got it is irrelevant. And another case called XY uh, involved an Ethiopian woman who, again, was living with HIV, had no family back in her country, Ethiopia, and so, um, and I'm trying to remember if this, yeah, this was a humanitarian application. The officer said, well, it's unlikely anyone's going to know about the fact that you have HIV. I know that in Ethiopia, people with HIV are severely stigmatized and discriminated against, but basically just keep it to yourself and everything will be okay. And again, the court applied um, jurisprudence from other areas, um, claims of persecution based on religious grounds where the board has said, well, just you know, practice in your basement, no one will ever find out. Uh, courts have consistently said that's not a, an answer to a claim based on religious persecution or sexual orientation, the same thing. Just don't tell anybody. Uh, no one's going to find out that you're gay. Um, same thing applied to HIV. And, and the court said it's irrelevant, you know, whether um, or how likely it is that the government will find out. Um, really, the only issue is what hardship would the person face if it were discovered. And uh, I guess finally, in terms of just medical inadmissibility, last month the government announced that it was making changes to the uh, act. Um, people can be found inadmissible uh, to Canada if they have a health condition that uh, would cause an excessive demand on health or social services. And um, the way they determine that is they say, well, the average cost uh, for medical treatment for a citizen living in Canada is so much a year, about $6,500 a year. And they look at that over either a one-year or five-year period. Well, last month, the government said it's going to triple that um, guideline, meaning that you know more people are, or fewer people will be found inadmissible because the cost of their medication, for example, won't hit that limit, won't be excessive by Canadian standards. And also, they're going to remove from the definition of social services such things as special education, social and vocational rehab, rehabilitation services, personal support services. Um, in all of these announcements, the devil's in the detail. Uh, the government said it's going to come out with a, a practice guidance or delivery instructions for officers uh, by June 1st, so we still don't know yet um, exactly you know, the extent of these changes, but change is coming and I think it's generally positive.
Thank you, Michael. Um, so we hope that, you know, the six issues that we've identified for you today provide some food for thought for some future research, for some investigation on your part, um, and some, you know, um, underlying themes that could be useful to the work that you're doing. Um, I want to open the floor up to questions now. Um, if you could ask, uh, identify yourself before asking your question, that would be helpful. Um, and I, I, I'll suggest, you know, taking two or three questions at a time so that the panel can um, address them all at the same time. And if there's questions online, that would be, we're, wel we're welcoming people online to take questions. Hi, thanks uh, for that. Uh, uh, thanks for the panel. Uh, super interesting and uh, and highly uh, highly topical. Uh, so uh, I'm Sean Rehag, um, and uh, I'm I'm interested in the the safe third country kind of question. There's so many things that are problematic about the safe third country agreement, but one of the things I've often wondered is why advocates for refugees haven't done more with the, the concurring opinion in the Federal Court of Appeal uh, in, in the, the Canadian Council for Refugees case, and specifically uh, where, um, uh, where Justice uh, Evans uh, agrees that, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the majority opinion that uh, there are uh, administrative law uh, reasons why the uh, uh, why the the court shouldn't uh, look into the substance of whether or not the United States is safe, but goes on to say, obviously because of Singh, um, uh, it can't be the case that Canada can send someone to the United States who would meet the Canadian refugee definition, but who wouldn't be protected in the United States, and thus says, in the existing regulations. It must be possible to uh, to demand an individualized assessment before the person is sent back uh, to uh, uh, is sent back to the United States, and that that individualized assessment should be subject to um, uh, subject to federal court uh, oversight. And even goes on to say, the government should develop guidelines to um, set out how this individualized assessment uh, should happen. And it seems to me that if if th that there would still be problems with safe there, there would be problems about encouraging a regular migration and leading to kind of the, the creation of, of, of uh, illegals rather than asylum seekers. There's the, the, the rhetorical problems, particularly in the current context. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't resolve everything. But fundamentally, the big problem is Canada is doing indirectly what it can't do directly. And it seems to me there's resources to, to prevent that. My name is Yukari Ando from Japan. My question to Laila, the so length of detention, uh, as well as Canada, Japan doesn't have the uh, limited time of the detentions in different detention. So I'm just wondering, what is the re reasoning why you don't, in Canada, you don't have that <coughs> limited time of detention? <laughs> because now you are challenging before the court, right? And you lost in the <coughs> lower stage. So I would like to know the reasoning why you legitimize, I mean, the court legitimize the uh, things of the We'll take those two questions and maybe we'll see if there's any online questions. So, so I mean, excellent point, Sean. Um, a number of things. I think, you know, one of the problems with the first challenge was that um, John Doe never actually went to the Canadian border and the, the court commented on that and also at that time said, um, you know, you three organizations shouldn't have standing anyway. We really need an individual uh, to come forward. So um, this time, uh, we made a great effort to find someone. And, and one of the practical problems is finding an applicant, A, who's got the courage to challenge 
uh, to make a court challenge. I mean, people arriving at the border obviously are extremely a vulnerable situation, but we, you know, also, but to know in advance that someone is coming and someone's going to make that claim, not to say it's impossible, but I think it's, you know, it's a practical challenge. Uh, the other consideration is that, you know, the Safe Third Country Agreement, as you say, is systemic. And even if we could succeed in one, you know, the, the, the court and the Federal Court of Appeals said, yeah, there should be some individual assessment of risk. Um, but I think the problem is so much bigger than individuals, and I think that's why we decided to go this time with a sort of general uh, <laughs> attempt again to get the whole thing uh, challenged. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think under the law that uh, a very good argument could be said, look at if you send me back, you know, my six and seven rights are at risk. I'm at the Canadian border. Singh says six and seven applies to me. Um, so I agree with you, um, but that's, you know, as I say, I think it's um, the reason why we've, we've gone the way we've gone in this case is, is, is to challenge the whole damn thing. Uh, in terms of your question, I think the reasoning, uh, the reason why they've been able to get around uh, uh, a uh, 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 an amount of days, a maximum time of detention is because the argument is that there is a system that reviews the detention period very systematically. So the first review of detention happens within the first 48 hours, uh, and then it's after seven days, and thereafter it's every 30 days. So the argument that's been uh, uh, accepted by the court, by the federal court, when there has been a challenge is, look, it's being reviewed. There's a comprehensive system. Every month this person's detention is being reviewed. So that's how they, they get around it. They're, there are, I mean, the U.S. has, uh, in Europe, they have a maximum 90 days. Uh, and the U.S. has said that it's, I think, I believe it's six months, where unless it's reasonably foreseeable that the person will be removed. But in Canada, they say, well, look, we have a comprehensive system. And if it's not working, there's judicial review, right? But it's, it's, not, it's not working when you have people that are in detention for two, three, four, five, six, seven years. Are there any other questions? Um, thank you all for these excellent presentations, but more so the amazing work you're doing. Like, obviously, it's incredibly time consuming and demanding, so just thank you. Um, these are hugely important issues. Um, the question I was curious about, um, Lila, you mentioned the problem of ministerial interventions, and I'm just curious if there have been any observable differences uh, since the change in government in terms of maybe the volume of ministerial interventions or if there's been any reduction in that. Um, and then um, we have in the other room, I think we have the UNHCR presenting re related to the global compacts, but it seems to me the Liberals and even the Conservatives before seem to keep bringing up the notion that the UNHCR approves of the U.S. as having an adequate system. So I'd, I would be interested for any comments about that or, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, in terms of ministerial interventions, I don't have any statistics. I don't know. I know that uh, for a person that acts as a designated representative, I see it coming up more. And you don't actually, I mean, I was in, I was designated representative for a case Jackie and I were before the Refugee Protection Division. It was a woman who had fled extremely violent man. Uh, she was from Congo. They were in Belgium and they had, she had five children. and. The children wanted to speak because the level of violence, even against the children, was huge. And she mentioned during her hearing that she had left, that they, she had started a custody order in court, and she had left. And the board member, like, gleefully said, like, what? You left with, it, you know, with this court thing? This is, you know, exclusion. And uh, I want to see all of, we, we had to resume. And so, 
and that's the disturbing trend. The disturbing trend is that even when there is no Hague, even when there's not necessarily a ministerial intervention, the minute there's an issue of children leaving, if you read what's happening on the listserv, it's coming up more. So there's more discussion among lawyers about what are the defenses, because our defense is under the criminal code and under the Hague, but you really have to, you're in a completely different ballgame. Like, this is about trying to, this, you know, there are women who have, legitimately fought years of violence and the children are exposed to it, if not directly, indirectly, right? So it changes, right? So I can't answer in terms of this, like, and for me it hasn't changed with the government, it's just a trend that you see, that the fact that it's on the listserv, the fact that, you know, it's, it's coming up more, I think, is what's disconcerting, and that it's a, it's a gender issue. Uh, yeah, the UNHCR. It's a very good point. And the government is relying on the UNHCR to say that the United States is safe and their, you know, their system is acceptable. Uh, if you were in the other room and you asked the UNHCR rep, look, do you, do you actually monitor what happens to people who are turned back on the Safe Third Country Agreement? They don't. They don't have the resources to do so and they don't. So uh, on our sort of litigation team, we've struggled with this very same question. And we've tried to find some evidence to counteract uh, what the UNHCR says. So we, you know, the fact, the reality is almost everyone who's turned back now under the Safe Third Country Agreement is detained. Um, and we've got uh, evidence of detainees, their own personal stories. We have all sorts of lawyers who've been working on the Canada-US border um, who are representing people in detention. And they're all saying basically the same thing. Uh, the Canadian authorities hand, you know, question the person here, hand over some package of materials or documents based on God knows what's in there to the U.S. authorities, and those people are almost invariably put into detention, and some of them have been in there for quite a long time. And we have that evidence in our case. Um, we've also got an agreement from Professor Jim Hathaway, who's an authority on refugee law, um, to say something about how the UNHCR monitors and, and to critique their position. Uh, he's a busy guy, so we may have to write that affidavit ourselves, but he said he'd sign it. Um, no, he hasn't done so yet, so. But you're right, it's, it's, uh, that's, a, you know, that's a pretty, that's a staple of the government's case against us, which is, hey, the UNHCR says it's okay, so who are we to say no? We've accumulated a lot of people with a lot of expertise on the U.S. system who've really come to bat for us and, and sworn really exhaustive and lengthy and detailed affidavits, um, and we're going to rely on that evidence. Are there any more questions? Okay, I just want to thank so much Jackie, Mike, and Lila. There are very, very busy lawyers who obviously have a lot on their plate. They're doing, you know, important legal groundwork, but they're also being involved as advocates, you know, looking at the overarching themes of our society and, and taking up important legal challenges like this. So I want to thank them for their time today and for coming to a conference like this to share their thoughts.